Now that's where we went wrong before somewhere. All right, good afternoon and welcome to our seventh and final webinar in the Wisconsin Citizen Lake Monitoring Network Spring Webinar Series. This is Paul Skowinski, the statewide educator for the network. Our webinars are recorded. Uh, many of you have joined our previous webinars already and, and seen the recordings. So you will be able to find a recording of today's webinar as well on our Extension Lakes YouTube channel. You can see it there on your screen, UWEX Lakes is what you would search for. I'll also send out a link to the recording by tomorrow to everyone that registered for today's webinar. And feel free to share this recording further if you know of others that would be interested in the information today. When I send out the link to the recording, I will also include a link to the playlist that we've set up on YouTube, which includes all of our webinars to date, and it will also include this one. Please keep yourself muted and your webcams turned off during the presentation. I will turn off any webcams that I, I see pop up just to keep bandwidth issues down to a minimum and to keep the webinar running as smoothly as we can, we can have it run today. Um, please post all of your questions into the chat box. I'll be monitoring that and John will take all of the questions at the end of the presentation today. So today's webinar focuses on lake ice with Dr. John Magnuson, Emeritus Professor of Limnology and the former director of the Center for Limnology at UW-Madison. John has been researching lake ice as part of a National Science Foundation project since 1980. John, I'll let you take it from here. And again, just let me know by just saying next when you'd like me to advance to the next slide. Well, thanks, Paul. And thank you, uh, anybody who's out there that have joined us. What I'm gonna do is talk about an idea and use lake ice as an example. Uh, and the idea is the invisible present in place. And the idea is that we tend to think locally and we tend to think very short term. And I'll use the lake ice to point out how we can look more broadly and longer term. Next. Well, how do we deal with change? Uh, this just happens to be a few shots around Lake Mendota, and it's pretty apparent the canoeist in the lower right uh, made a good decision. The person who's in the sailboat with an offshore wind uh, made a good decision, and in the upper right, nobody's out there. Uh, we deal with change and we respond to change. Next slide. Changes occur both quickly and slowly, and here's sort of a time scale of changes of things that occur in seconds and minutes uh, out to the other end of things that occur in centuries and millennia. And you see we move from thunderstorms to day versus night, seasons, eutrophication or overenrichment of lakes, land use changes, and kind of climate change. We're pretty good at responding to the things on the lower left such as a thunderstorm. We know to come out of the rain. We know not to stand under a tree. Uh, day and night, we're not bad at. We know, to, most of us know when to go to bed and when to get up. Seasons, we begin to know when to get the boat out and when to get the ice fishing gear out. Uh, we, when you get to longer term things like eutrophication and land use, they're harder for us to adapt to and learn about rapidly. So for example, in Wisconsin, many of our lakes are eutrophic, have too many nutrients, especially in the southern, more agricultural regions. Uh, our lakes have seen a lot of land use, and these occur over years and decades. And then climate change is the slow one here. It occurs over years, decades, uh, actually decades and centuries, and it's hard for us to see and respond to changes that are slow like that. Next. And so the invisible present, this is Big Ben here. And what the invisible present idea is, is that we tend to think that uh, what we see today is what's there. And we have a hard time putting that in the context of what's happened before and what may likely occur in the future. The invisible present, next. People have thought about time and for a long time. I, I especially like this quote by uh, a Roman emperor who also uh, was pretty much a philosopher. And he talked about time in a way that I think is relevant to this issue of being able to respond to climate change. Time is sort of a river of passing events, as strong as its current. No sooner is a thing brought into sight than it is swept by, and another takes its place. And this too will be swept away. 
Well, that was pretty insightful. And uh, that was given almost over 2,000 years ago. Next slide. Okay, well, I'm going to use Lake Mendota ice duration as a way of illustrating where we sit if we live in the invisible present. And here you see the duration of ice cover from 1850 to 2000. You see an opening, uh, a white area with one data point. And what I want you to think of is think of the analogy of opening a shade so that you can see what's outside. In this case, we're going to open the window so that we can see what's happened before. So let's begin to open that window. This, uh, this one year is interesting, but it doesn't tell us much about how to respond to change. Next. If we open it up to 10 years, we now notice that the ice cover duration is highly variable from year to year. In fact, that red one is less than a month, and uh, the longest one is uh, almost uh, three months. And we don't see any long-term pattern. We just see a bunch of variability with extreme events. Next. If we open it up to 50 years, you'd think we'd begin to see more, and we do. We see that the variability continues. There's a lot of variability. That particular year is still uh, the shortest ice cover. If you were trying to study climate change and were wondering if there was shorter ice durations and you used a 50-year graph like this, I think you'd be hard pressed to determine whether in fact that the slope of that line, the rate of change of ice cover uh, getting shorter and shorter would be statistically significant. But let's open Mendota up to the full record. Next. Here it is. It began in the 1850s, continues to today. And again, we see that that one year was the shortest on record. We fit a linear regression or a line through it. And one of the things you can do with a line like this that you fit to these data is you can say, well, how rapidly is the change occurring? And here you see it's a changing almost two degrees per decade or 20 days per 100 years. And that that line, all that variability you're looking at, that line only explains about 22% of it. Almost 80% of the variation you see of the ice dates, ice cover dates, ice cover over the years is not explained by that line. Next. But a lot of things you can do once you have a long-term data set like this. First of all, with that last line, that was certainly statistically significant. Now here what we've done is we've taken the longest 10 years in the upper left and the shortest 10 years mostly in the lower right. And so with something like this, you can begin to look at, is there something happening to extreme years? Did we used to have uh, extremely long years in some years? And do we now have extremely short ice cover in some years? And you can see that's clearly the case. The blue dots in the upper left, all of them occur before 1900. In other words, we had one winter there, that one longest. You can imagine people had a hard time setting us up enough potatoes and parsnips to get through to the next summer. And in the lower right, we see most of the recent 10 shortest years are in the lower right, including our one long year we started out with in the invisible present. This tells us more about what's going. We're moving out of the invisible present by beginning to put that one year in the context of what's going on. Next. I kind of like this graph. Uh, if you look in the upper right, uh, there's a, and across the top there, there's a dashed blue line. And uh, it starts at one of the high points, one of the longest winters ice covers we've had in, in, in recent years. And it's drawn straight across. And you'll notice that uh, in the 1850s, that longest date in the 2000s is the average date in the 1850s. If you look at the red line, it's the same issue, but it goes the other way. If you look at the average date on the far right and follow the dashed line to the left, you say that is considerably below what the average date was in the 1850s. So we've had a significant change in ice cover on this particular lake. Uh, over the last 150 some years. 
And in fact, if you put that in another context, you could say that if you're a winter person that likes to skate and fish and things like that in the wintertime, you've lost 25%, one month or 25% on average of winter measured by duration of ice cover. 164 winters we have now. Next slide. Well, here's Lake Mendota on one of the latest ice days we've ever had, January 20th in 19, 2007. It used to be that the ice fishers would get their gear all geared up and start and fish between Christmas and New Year's. And at Christmas and New Year's in this particular year, the lake was wide open. There's another thing about this very late date that's a little bit dangerous. For example, that night we had a, a small snow occur. And the next morning, the lake was entirely covered with snow. If you walked in from out of town, didn't know that the day before was when it froze, you might say, oh, there's a beautiful ice covered lake. Let's get out and walk on it. And the ice would only be an inch or less thick and you wouldn't get to the other side. Next slide. Well, we first came up with the idea of talking about what you learn from having a longer and longer view uh, in a bioscience magazine article and published in 1990. And it was based on the thesis research of a young man at that time by the name of Dale Robertson. And he got his PhD at, uh, at the Center for Limnology. But here you see at that date, which was only 132 years of data, you see the same idea, the top invisible present, 10 years, more variable and high variability. Uh, the next one actually was related to El Nino events. And the last one uh, showed the whole period of record and we didn't run a, re a regression or anything through it. Next slide. Okay, so here is the record again. That thesis project that Dale had and when we started talking about the invisible present, uh, the time series was 130 two years. And we've added to the right of the red line, the red dash line, uh, these additional years. And if this program keeps going and the people at the state climatology office keep recording the ice on and ice off, there's no reason why this record wouldn't continue to persist until winters when we had no ice. Next. Now, in addition to all that short-term variation, short, high extremes, low extremes. If you run a running mean through this, let's say a 10 year moving average, what you see is that the record does not, the ice cover does not change in a systematic or linear fashion always. For example, you notice in the middle of the graph, uh, there's almost 50 years where the ice duration doesn't seem to change at all. If you look to the left-hand side of the graph, you see, uh, about a 30 year period where it was getting uh, less ice. And if you look to the right hand side of that flat period, you see another period where it's declining. And so one thing that happens when you are in the invisible present, you look at the period of records you might have had. Let's say you move to Madison, Wisconsin on 2001, and you looked at the next 10 or 15 years, you'd probably as some people did, wrote a letter to the editor and said, look, we're, that's nothing to say about climate change. The ice duration in this lake is getting longer and longer. Well, they were operating and that statement was made within the invisible present. Uh, clearly, there's a lot of variation and it occurs at different frequencies. Uh, and uh, you cannot say something very certain from short records. Next slide. I'm gonna skip this one. Okay, next thing we need to do is invisible place. I don't know how often when you've had a problem with your lake, if you don't try to explain it by something that's happening locally. Uh, somebody uh, just put in an inadequate septic tank or uh, something else happened. They cut all the trees down on their shoreline and the changes that are occurring in my lake are uh, caused by what's happening in and around my lake. But the same idea is, if you want to know what's happening, for example, to ice cover, 
and you only looked at the lake in Lake Mendota in southern Wisconsin, that says nothing about whether, in fact, this is a global phenomenon. Is this just something unique and local to Madison? I mean, we've got uh, all the professors like me uh, talking all the time. We have the, pup, the uh, politicians doing the same thing, and the students are running up and down State Street. Maybe Mendota is unique that this is not a characteristic that has, that it, it's not an invisible place. It is the way the world is. Next slide. Well, we have a lot of nice quotes about space too. Uh, this one is one of the earliest I could find. Not being able to see the forest for the trees. Uh, actually what he had written in English at that time, was well, you can't see the wood, I guess woods for the trees. And you cannot tell what's happening to the lakes of the world by looking at one lake. It just doesn't tell you anything. You're operating in an invisible place, out of context with what's happening east, west, south, north of you. Next slide. And so let's take a look around Wisconsin. Uh, Madison's in the southern part of Wisconsin, and a very northerly place where we have ice in Wisconsin is at Apostle Islands National Lakeshore. And it's on the coast of uh, Lake uh, Superior. And uh, there's a community there called Bayfield. And there's an island uh, that uh, people live on, and but yet they work in Bayfield or their kids go to school in Bayfield. And so there's a ferry that runs back and forth. Next slide. Well, we, that ferry or boats, if you like, if we go back to earlier days, that enter the harbor at Bayfield, or the, if we say the last boat to leave the harbor in the fall, and then we write down the first boat to leave in the spring, the reason they didn't leave in the winter, of course, it was ice covered. And for the first 50 years of this record, it was a local a journal kept by one of the, the residents of the area. And in more recent years, it would be reported in the newspaper. And now even the ferry company keeps track of what's going on. And you notice it has some characteristics that we share with the lake in the southern part of the state in that the uh, line that represents the uh, overall trend is declining. There is less ice cover now than there was 150 years ago. In fact, it's changing more rapidly than Lake Mendota, even though it's in the northern part of the state and Mendota's in the southern part of the state. Well, why is that? Well, you notice in recent years, in fact, uh, there's been a number of years where the boats have run all winter, the ferry company has run all winter. Next slide. Now the ice road, is the way that the kids get to school and the way that the adults uh, on Madeline Island get to Bayfield to work. And here you see three pictures of the ice road on a couple of different winters. And uh, people bike across, they walk across, uh, all these things happen. Occasionally a car gets almost sunk, but doesn't sink. And then just before ice out, you begin to get puddles of water on the ice road. And pretty soon, somebody gets up and says, okay, it's not safe anymore. Uh, we're gonna have to resort to going back to the ferry again. Next slide. Well, in 19, 2016, the ferry ran all winter long. And you can see it here, it's pulling into uh, the harbor at Bayfield. And uh, it's pretty clear that uh, there's plenty of ice around. And the ferries today are pretty good icebreakers. And so one of the things that's likely to have happened during this record is that the ferries today can break through about six inches of ice. And some of the sailboats and wooden hull vessels oh, around the turn of the, from the, when the 1900s started probably couldn't break ice as well. So that's probably part of it as well. Next slide. And so you see a mixture here of two things happening. Well, three things I think to mention. One is, uh, the boats are coming and going with a shorter and shorter non-period for using the ferry. The ferries in recent years are sometimes able to run all year long, and you see three or four winters there in the far lower right. 
Another thing that why does this change faster than Mendota is Mayfield, the Apostle Islands are in a bay of Lake Superior. And Lake Superior doesn't freeze completely anymore, and it hasn't for a number of years. And so there's open water not far away. And so there's also a connection with Lake Superior uh, that contributes to this decline. So sometimes the records are complex. Next slide. Well, let's look at Wisconsin generally. Believe it or not, we have quite a few people. In fact, there's a lot of people in the uh, citizen monitoring networks now that are doing ice breakup and uh, ice formation on the lake that you live on. But here's a bunch that we've had for some time. And let's look at, uh, there's Lake Superior in the far north, right on Lake Superior. I mean, pardon me, Bayfield, right on Lake Superior. Uh, lake Geneva in the far right-hand corner, down to the bottom near uh, Illinois. You see Mendota in the lower part of the figure in the center. Next slide. Well, here's the straight lines calculated from the ice cover data on all of these uh, lakes. And you'll notice uh, it doesn't look like a pile of pickup sticks with each stick going a different direction. Every one of these is going in the same direction. Ice cover duration is getting less and less and less. And it's true for short records like some of those uh, in the northern part of the state that are only uh, about 40 years long and some of, but it's occurring everywhere. So we're beginning to move out of what we would call the invisible place. Certainly this loss of ice cover uh, duration uh, is not unique to Lake Mendota. Is it unique to Wisconsin? Next slide. In 1996, uh, again, but with this National Science Foundation grant, we brought a bunch of people from across the United States and Europe and Asia together to, uh, we knew that we had colleagues in other countries and other states that were recording these ice out states. And so we brought together the people who had the longest records available and we wrote a paper, uh, published in it uh, in a pretty good journal. Uh, and I wanna show you the results we got when we extended our observations from Mendota to Wisconsin uh, to the Northern Hemisphere. Next slide. And here's what we got. Now, I've shown the data a little bit differently. The upper lines are the breakup dates. And you'll notice the breakup dates are getting earlier and earlier. The bottom lines are freeze dates or ice on date. And you notice that's getting later and later and later. Uh, the distance between these two lines, of course, is the duration of ice cover. And you can see that's getting shorter and shorter and shorter. So this is not due to the students or professors producing so much energy and hot air, this is in fact something that's true for the Northern Hemisphere or a good portion of it. The lakes that you see here, uh, some of them are the SU, those are in Finland, Otsigo's in New York, Baikal's in Russia. Now, when we published this paper, it was a little bit ahead of its time. And we got a lot of questions from the reporters that interviewed us is how do you know that the people, that all these things are recorded the same way through time? And uh, how do you know that uh, this is data's worth anything at all? Uh, we certainly didn't have standards. This was public data. It was data that was created for the purpose of navigation and for the purposes of uh, uh, travel on the ice, and make ice, and lots of other things. But the argument I could use, I couldn't say, well, uh, John Smith in 1880 standardized the way we measured Lake Mendota. Well, we don't know how John Smith recorded the Lake Mendota in the 1880s. But I think something that provided evidence that in fact these records are valid is that how is it that John Smith's records and our records of the state climatologists in recent years from Mendota provide the same kind of general trend towards the loss of ice cover in the wintertime in Russia, Finland, New York, and Wisconsin. Now, that was pretty convincing to me, and that seemed to satisfy most of them that one couldn't imagine a conspiracy 
that got all these people in these various parts of the Northern Hemisphere to record things on the same dates or in the same way. The other thing that is interesting that makes me believe these data a lot uh, has to do with the what are the 10 year running averages. You see some, some curvy lines following around each one of the, uh, the straight lines. And if you look at a number of these places, you see they have highs and they have lows. And for example, let's take a look uh, around uh, 1940 or so. And we see that on the very top, there's a peak in that orange line at the very top. And then you look at the other lakes just below that, and there's a peak except in one of them, and in the one set below that. And there's also a peak in many of the lakes uh, break updates as well. And so not only are the slopes consistent with each other, but the highs and lows tend to track each other. I thought the data were quite believable. Next slide. Well, lake ice is a minor, a minor canary for climate change. It's a well-known term. I think it has some advantages. One is you might expect ice would be very sensitive to warming. And we've been told and learned about the ice in the Arctic Ocean and breaking away from Antarctica, shortening the glaciers, glacier in the National Park. The neat thing about a lake ice, besides being very sensitive to warming, it's also scattered amongst the people that live there. In other words, there's a lot of people near Mendota. There's a lot of people near Lake Superior. And these lakes are making a record of what's happening that's much longer than the weather records in these areas that, that in fact is sensitive to climate change. Next slide. Well, another thing that I've always been a little surprised at is, uh, if you think about the influence of declining ice on us people, uh, a lot of people that are not from a northern temperate or boreal or arctic climate have a hard time believing that anybody would like winter, anybody would like ice. But let's take a look at the way loss of ice influences people. Next slide. Well, here's a funny little circle diagram, but it brings up, uh, this was written by a bunch of people brought together by Leslie Knoll, who works at Itasca uh, for the University of Minnesota. And around the second row of light blue is a number of terms like subsistence, recreation, ceremony, artistic, education, and research. Inside that's another circle, and inside there's another circle. And you begin to get more and more specific of ways in which people use lake ice and are used to including it into their culture. Uh, you see ice fishing, ice skating, religious processions. Uh, you see ice sculptures, winter carnivals, citizen science, et cetera, et cetera. I'll give you a couple of examples in more detail. Let's take a look at some of the ways people use Mendota and also uh, the Apostle Island area. Next slide. Well, they play and they train kids. They go ice fishing, they uh, ice sail, they uh, play jokes and have Lake Mendota being having the emergence of the Statue of Liberty. Uh, we have winter carnivals. And the far right down the lower right hand corner, you see people walking along to look at the ice caves in the Apostle Islands National Seashore. There have been winters recently where in fact people have not been able to take this hike, but in fact it's very popular. If you've got a good cold winter, I encourage you to do it while we've still got it. Next slide. Well, the paper that Leslie Noel wrote with her colleagues also found records of use of winter ice, like in the upper left, winter ice roads, uh, in the center, ice skating in around Stockholm, and the right top, uh, a Shinto ritual on Lake Sua, the lower left, ice fishing in Minnesota, and in the lower center, another uh, religious festival uh, in, in Europe. Now, for these, we didn't have a long, long record on ice fishing going back 150 years, but we did have temperature records and ice records, and we had ice fishing tournaments and things of that nature. 
And so what we were able to do with these records is we were able to find that in fact, uh, ice fishing tournaments were canceled more in the warmer winters in Minnesota and more recently and more in the southern part of the state than in the northern part of the state. And that holds for these other kind of things as well. So we don't have the long records on these uses, but we do have the records of a number of years that are long enough to see that they're related to ice and that they're related to winter temperatures. Next slide. How about a little more science? How long has science recognized the importance of CO2 in warming the atmosphere? Well, at least since 1896, through the works of uh, a Swedish chemist. And I read a quote that came out of his paper. In fact, why don't you read it yourself? You can do that, it's short. Well, how long ago was the Eosin? Well, around 50 million years ago. So he was projecting already before 1900 that if the carbon dioxide went up, uh, the temperatures of this world we live in would uh, go up. Next slide. Well, the uh, reason for that, of course, is people pretty well know the idea of the greenhouse gases and carbon dioxide being one of the more abundant greenhouse gases. Man by the name of Charles Keeling put a station on top of Mauna Loa, uh, made an observatory up there, and started recording uh, CO2 in the atmospheric gases from the top of this rather tall mountain uh, in the 1850s, and it continues to today. Couple of things to point out about this. Nobody would need any statistical means whatsoever to determine that CO2 is increasing. In fact, one way of putting in context for you is if you were born after 1956 or so, see if you can find your birth year and read off the CO2 concentration on the top of Mount Manoa Loa for that year, and then go to the top right or the number on the top, 407, you find that uh, you have a situation, you can count how much the CO2 in the atmosphere has gone up during your lifetime. Another thing to point out is, uh, one of my climatology friends told me this, is John, you and your students will never ever again be in a world that is less than 400 parts per million CO2 even if we do a lot of mitigating. The other thing that's of interest in this graph, it doesn't seem to be flattening. In other words, it's still going up. Next slide. Well, we have ice records that are actually a lot longer than 150 years and a lot longer than Keeling CO2 records. But the longest one we've been able to find is for a Shinto shrine on Suiko or Lake Sua in Japan. It's in the Japanese Alps. Uh, and they're not as tall as the uh, Alps in Switzerland, but in fact, they're high enough that they have ice covered lakes on them. Next slide. And in the wintertime, here you see uh, the religious ceremony being held and the ice, the expansion and contraction is occurring in the ice as it does with warm days and sunny days and cold nights and the ice buckles and it's caused by the expansion and contraction of the ice. But these people began to note this and celebrate it in the four, early 1400s. Now that was before Columbus discovered or didn't discover America. It was also before the Gutenberg Bible was written. And so the people of that, the, the, pre, the priests at that time tried to explain this and they came up with a little parable. Uh, first of all, the Shinto religion has both male and female gods and they would start recording when this event occurred. And the reason they argued, didn't argue, told the story that it was important was because when, what caused it? Well, they didn't know about the expansion and contraction of ice. They didn't know about climate change. They didn't know any of that stuff. And they said that, well, there's a female shrine on one side of the lake, a male shrine on the other side of the lake. And we celebrate this day because that male shrine, male rather large guy, the male uh, 
God walked across the lake. And as he walked across the lake, the ice would buckle. And so then this was celebrated every year and every year uh, with some problems. But it started in around 1442 or something like that. Next slide. And here I am at the shrine. That's me, a little red face. I don't know why. Uh, and the priest, young priest, young, the son of the one that we saw in the last picture is to my right and a couple of scientists and the fellow who is learning how to make the observation on Sua Ko uh, this next winter. Now, they wrote down all these things. They had a record. And let's look at the record. Next slide. Well, let's look at a more recent ceremony. Uh, ceremony is the same. You see the ice ridge? Not very big. These people are probably on thin ice. And in fact, in recent years, often the ice does not even form. And so there is no ice ridge or omovatari to celebrate. Next slide. Yeah, here's the data. Look at the top graph. Began in the 1400s, ice freeze day of the year. We don't have duration, just the ice freeze date. And it was shortly after that, that the Omovatari would form. And then in the middle of the Lake Sua record, you see a bunch of grayed out points. The Japanese scholars that we interacted with and read their papers had no confidence in those ice freeze dates. And they didn't use them. Uh, and they suggested they're interesting, look at them, but don't use them for analysis. So we didn't, and we hated to, we dropped them out. And you see the left-hand side, uh, there's high variability, just like uh, for Mendota. Uh, there's also a slight increase. You see the line is a little bit uh, warm. And then on the right-hand side, uh, you see the same variability, sort of, and you see the uh, a much deeper line. The other long record we have is for a river between Finland and Sweden, the River Torn. And we have about 300 years of observation, and it was made every year. Now, the ice in that Finnish river has formed every year uh, during this whole record period. But what we did is we took uh, a number of the most extreme dates and looked at uh, the date of uh, breakup, and then we plotted the numbers of those breakups. But you see a break in this graph. And you see the graph breaks at around 1850 or so. That's sort of in the boundary of one of the so-called uh, industrial revolution things and might have been evidence that it, the shift occurred because of an increase in CO2 in the atmosphere well before Keeling. Next slide. Here's a little table that may help. Lake Sua, River Torn. Uh, before and after one of the major industrial revolution changes that occurred. And you notice that for Lake Sua, the ice uh, is changing more rapidly after the Industrial Revolution. You notice for River Torn, the ice is changing more rapidly. And the sign differences are one's ice on and one's ice off. Uh, so the early records before the Industrial Revolution, some change, but not very strong. After the Industrial Revolution, it increased both at a high latitude, Finland, and farther south, Japan. Next slide. Well, this is not a scientific analysis, but it's kind of interesting. Uh, first of all, the top graph is the most interesting. Notice it begins back in 1443, and the uh, lake froze every winter for a few years. And the height of those bars are the proportion of years when it didn't freeze and an omovatari didn't occur. And you notice it's going up. And you notice for since 1949 to 2004 that in about 20% of the winters, the lake didn't freeze. And of course, that religious ceremony was not held. The bottom one, uh, we took some of the most extreme years. And you see again for the river, uh, the same thing is occurring. Uh, and those extreme years are more common in recent years than they were in the early records in the 1600s. Now, what's not too scientific, I 
Googled a bit and found out what dates uh, have people called the first, second, and third industrial revolution, the beginning of it, and I drew a vertical line for each one of them. I think there's a lot more science that could be done here, but what you notice is every one of those lines tends to occur when, in fact, the number of years when the lake doesn't freeze completely or the river doesn't freeze completely uh, has uh, passed through in a a new phase of the Industrial Revolution. Next slide. A little more science. Uh, this is about 100 years, and it's for about 60, 70 lakes. And the proportion of these lakes around the Northern Hemisphere that didn't freeze in a winter from 1905 to 2005. And, and what you see is not hard to imagine the relationships statistically valid the number the proportion of these 60 or 70 lakes that didn't freeze is increasing as we go to the right next slide now extremes we've talked about more extremes more warm extremes recently and let's just look at the top way the one way we could get more warm winters, if you like, or hotter extremes, is just for the climate to change and move to the right. And as the new climate has the same variability, those are the temperatures, uh, blah, 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 and you find you get less cold weather, so, and you find you get more warm weather, and so you begin to get warm extremes and you get a loss of cold extremes, which is what we saw for Lake Mendota. I'm gonna skip the two bottom graphs, but they're worth consideration. Uh, you can look them up and play around with more complexities of whether uh, not only does the climate change, but the climate variability changes. Next slide. Now, I'm gonna be talking about a paper that uh, Sapna Sharma and a bunch of us wrote uh, having to do with where and when would we begin to get lakes around the entire northern hemisphere that did not freeze every winter. And you tend to have winters without complete ice cover under the following conditions. If annual temperatures are 8.4 degrees centigrade or warmer, or when the mean depth of the lake is greater, our model said 24 meters, but greater, Lake Superior, for example, uh, doesn't have complete ice and it's really deep. And when the elevation is closer to sea level rather than the top of a mountain, and the bottom one's a little fuzzy and I'll talk about it if we have time, you also tend to have winter sooner on a lake if the shoreline of the lake is closer to being round instead of one with a lot of bays and so forth. Well, what we did is we took this information, took what we had on data of lakes all around the Northern Hemisphere, and began to look where do we now have lakes that are not freezing by these criteria. And next slide. So here you're, this is a polar view. We're looking down from on top of the North Pole, North America on the left, Asia on the right, and some of the lakes are orange. And those orange lakes are ones that don't freeze every winter. They may freeze 9 out of 10 or 50 percent or 99 out of 100 winters. The gray area is lakes that reliably freeze. Now what we're going to do is we're going to increase the air temperature uh, first by 2 degrees, which was 2 degrees centigrade, which was uh, what the uh, Paris Accord was hoping we would be able to achieve. Uh, and we'll do another one for 4.5 degrees, which is if we do no mitigation of CO2 at all. So let's go to the two degree one. Next slide. You had to be looking. Uh, Paul, let's go back and forth. This is, yeah, a couple of times. So even if we get to the two degree warming, next slide, yeah. If we stop here, we already have had an extension northward of lakes that do not freeze every winter in our modeling. And uh, for those of you in Wisconsin, you can look at Lake Michigan pointing down and you get a feeling for where this was, where the line would be if we met the Paris Accord. Uh, and it was in Southern Lake Michigan if uh, we looked at the current conditions. 
in Asia, you notice it's uh, the four degree one is uh, in southern Sweden and includes most of France and a little bit of Germany and so forth. Okay, now let's go to the 4.5 degrees warmer. Next slide. And you notice it popped north again. Let's go back and forth a couple of times, one back, one forward. Okay, and let's look at the one forward. Now, now in the North America, it's almost covered completely all of Wisconsin. So that if we allow the climate to warm to 4.5 degrees, our modeling efforts based on those criteria uh, would uh, result in the lakes not freezing uh, every winter. Now that doesn't mean you go along with ice, 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 and then no ice, no ice, no ice, no ice, no ice. If you looked at that data on SUA when we looked at it, the proportion of the lakes, the proportion of years that it doesn't freeze slowly increases over the decades, depending on how fast climate warms. If you look in uh, the Europe side of this one, notice it's uh, now in southern Sweden and in southern Finland. Next slide. Well, here's a panorama, if you can track it, of all the colors and all the data. Now the black is, even if we go up to eight degrees centigrade warmer, go, God help us if we get there, there's still some lakes that, are, that freeze every winter. But if you look at uh, the entire Great Lakes region and southern Ontario, uh, the lakes will not freeze every winter. Uh, and so, but let's, and you can also pick out if you go to the blue data, the 4.5 degrees centigrade, or go to the two degree data warmer, and the purple, and you can see about where these would go for the region that you live in, uh, based on the models that we've done. And we call this condition intermittent ice. And that's because between the first year when you finally miss a year of ice cover, there are many, many years before, in fact, they never freeze. Next slide. Well, again, I want to bring us back to people. And if we take these conditions, current conditions, two degrees warmer, which is the Paris Accord, 4.5 degrees, which is an estimate of expected warming without any mitigation of greenhouse gas release. And we look at the number of lakes with intermittent ice under current conditions, the number of countries that have a lake with intermittent ice, and the number of people within one uh, grid cell of intermittent ice. Sorry, I can't quite tell you is how many miles that's from the lake, but it's a, it's a grid cell around the, in which the lake sits. And you'll notice that if we even get to the Paris Accord, there have been a significant increase in the number of lakes that won't have ice every winter. There's a significant increase of the number of countries that have lakes that don't go every winter. And there's more than 100 million more people that don't uh, that live in a grid cell. And if you go to 4.5, it gets worse and worse. Now, if you didn't care about ice, and I realize ice is not the same sort of variable as being able to raise agricultural crops and have water to drink and things of that nature. But <clears throat> we can expect significant changes that will occur if we don't do something with our climate. Next slide. How about Wisconsin? Well, Lake Geneva is already occasionally having a winter without complete ice. Why would that be the case? It's not true for Lake Mendota, and it's not true for trout in northern Wisconsin. Well, Lake Geneva is in the southernmost part of our state, which means it's a little warmer. So it's more likely to uh, be warm enough once in a while. Also, Lake Geneva is a deep lake, and so it's got to lose more heat before it can freeze. And so, and I think there's only been three years when it didn't freeze completely uh, at this date. For Lake Mendota, it's frozen every year, uh, and our calculations suggest that that'll not begin to be intermittent until somewhere in the realm of 1840, mid-century. Trout Lake, our calculations suggest that in Trout Lake, we will still have ice every winter. Next slide. Two more questions for today. 
and then we'll uh, go on in, with our lives. Are the declines in lake ice cover likely to continue? Well, some of those things we have control of, some we don't. What causes all the variability around the trend line for Lake Mendota? How come almost 80% is unexplained? and only about 20% is explained by the trend line. We'll deal with both those questions briefly. Next slide. Well, here's a paper that was published in 2015 by three climatologists that work at the UW-Madison. And they compared two periods of time uh, and the number of cold days that you would expect to get, first of all, in the last 40 years of the 1900s, and secondly, the mid 2000s. So they took the difference between the number that have occurred and the number that expected to have occurred uh, if you move to the middle of the next century. And it's a contour map. Uh, apologized if you can't see colors, but maybe you can see the shades. Uh, let's take uh, where Mendota is in South Central Wisconsin. And you notice that the number of cold days is expected to decrease by 15 days. Let's go to uh, Vilas County. The number of cold days are presumed to decrease by about 24 days or something like that. I don't have the European data for, for this sort of thing, but I think it's certainly likely to have, there's paper somewhere that somebody's tried to do this analysis. So the number of cold days is decreasing and that's going to contribute to ice having a smaller probability of forming. Next slide. I'm gonna skip this one. All that one does, but it would take too long to explain it, is that uh, the climate scientists can explain the increases in temperature if they use a model, the observed temperatures, if they use a model that includes greenhouse gases accumulation in it but they cannot if they do not. The only way they can get the model to produce a record similar to the observed record is to make sure the greenhouse gases were included in the model. Okay, what causes all the variability around the trend line? Since this accounts for 80% of Mendota's variability, uh, uh, might think it's, uh, this may be a little complex, but I'm gonna run through it simply. Let's take a look at it, next. Well, first of all, here is the same data from uh, 14 lakes, 150 years, put together by Sapna and me and others, of course, always. And the original time series is the top one. And I need to explain what this is, the zero line. If you go across there, the zero, that straight line across there is where we have made it possible to graph all lakes on the same graph by plotting their mean as zero. And on the left-hand side, uh, if their mean is not zero, it either goes up or down. The left-hand side, of course, are uh, when the, well, let's not go there. Anyway, it's plotted against the mean, and you can see the trend is changing very clearly with a straight line fit through it. Uh, for these 14 lakes over 150 years, where the lakes in the right-hand side, this is breakup date. So the breakup date is occurring earlier and earlier on the right-hand side. The breakup date on the left-hand side is later and later. Okay. Now, if you look at the top graph, to me, that reminds me of a crosscut saw. My grandpa was a lumberjack and he had some neat old crosscut saws around the barn. And that's what that looks like to me. If you run a running mean through that, and if you just do two years, you average every two years and then average it sequentially all the two year periods all through this time period, most of those really sharp high frequency peaks disappear. Not all of them, but a lot of them do. And this thing that has an oscillator in it that's so fast, it's in a two to two and a half years, is uh, essentially something we call the quasi-biennial oscillator. 
and it originates in the equatorial area and it occurs around the entire hemisphere, or northern hemisphere, and uh, it appears to have decreased the variability. And in fact, that means that maybe some of that variability is associated with that quasi biennial oscillation. We go down to a seven year means, which is the third panel. And here we used a seven year running mean. What that should do, if you've heard of El Nino, uh, it has oscillations that are not perfect oscillations, but it, and it has about a seven year period. And uh, so the set third one down eliminates the variability associated perhaps with El Nino's. And what you see is you've lost a lot more of that short term variability. If you go to the bottom graph, we used a 12 year mean, and that's an interesting one because there's a 10, 11 year solar cycle that occurs. And so that has also averaged across that solar cycle. And there what you see is that uh, all the sharp teeth are gone. You're still not left with a good fit to the straight line. And those are caused by climate oscillations that we sometimes call teleconnections or uh, climate forcing that occurs in an oscillatory fashion. And there's a lot of these you probably don't know of, but there are some of them. Next slide. Well, here's a review of the sources of variation. Uh, for example, let's start out with the trend. Depending on the data set we analyze and how long it is, 7 to 30% of the variation in that time series is associated with the trend. That quasi-biennial thing that makes the sawtooth oscillations, 9% is caused, is associated with that. El Nino's, another 8% is associated with that. The 10-year soil cycle only brings up another 2%. And then there are these longer term oscillations that were apparent in the bottom graph, uh, 20 years to 67 years. And in this analysis, they only accounted for about 4%. And oscillations that are 67 years long or longer, only 3%. Let me say something about these longer oscillations. Nobody would take very seriously our analysis of these with 150 years of data because to get an oscillation to have some statistical validity in the data, you have to have it occur more than once or twice or three or four or five times. Okay, weather, local weather. Not everything is, uh, if you look at your lake and you see when it breaks up and you see a front just came through or when it freezes, it was an unusually bitter night. There's a lot of local weather that is not explainable by these oscillatory dynamics at all. And then after you take all of these things into account, we end up only being able to explain 50% of the variability around that line. That means another 50% are unexplained. Well, that's a challenge. I'm not convinced we're gonna make that number any smaller either. But anyhow, these are the kind of things that contribute to the variability, and there may be some others we don't know about or don't know how to evaluate. Next. Summaries. Lake ice is a sensitive bellwether of climate change. It really is. By the way, bellwether is not misspelled. Look it up, see what it means. In a short-term view, high variability masks the longer trends of climate change, and truth is lost in what we call the invisible present. Analyzing lake ice can help us discriminate between climate change and shorter term climate variability and not say climate's changing when it's just part of the variability. In long term records, climate trends are visible even with the high short term variability. And the other point I've tried to make is the loss of lake ice is also the loss of an undervalued resource that is part of our sense of place. And I think we'll stop uh, right here and uh, see if there are questions. Well, thank you so much, John. Uh, if there are any questions, please type them into the chat box. We're right at one o'clock, although if John's okay with it, we can stick around for a few minutes and take questions if there are some. We don't have any in the chat box quite yet, 
So we'll just wait for a moment here and, and see if some questions come in. We still have 46, 45 people on the call. I think your studies, John, really point to the value of long-term data. Sometimes it just doesn't, uh, doesn't click that we need these long-term records and just a few years worth of data just isn't enough for a lot of these things. And you mentioned that 67 year oscillation um, for some of these things, we really need these very, very long-term data sets. Yeah, we have a question from Sharon in the chat. She's wondering if there is continued funding for these studies. Well, thanks for the question, Sharon. Uh, first of all, the project that uh, caused me to work on analyzing all of the stuff was a funded project by the National Science Foundation to the Center for Limnology. And uh, we started that uh, study in 1980, and it's still going forth. Uh, and uh, our new proposal for another six years is being evaluated. We hope uh, the reviewers like it. Uh, but the other things that are happening, uh, a lot of these observations are independent of the research per se. Uh, for example, a lot of people, some of you that are on the, on the, on the line today, uh, make these observations on your lake. And I think that those data sets will start getting longer and longer uh, make sure you document how the observation is made and try to do it the same as every year and then try to teach your children and grandchildren to do the same thing. And I think we're going to have a lot of data on most, many of these records now are only a few years long. Many more are in the 30 to 40 year period and so forth. So those kind of studies are longer term is becoming more popular. As we begin to work with things that are happening really slow, that are happening at decades and centuries, this is the only tool we have of being able to interpret the past is long-term uh, research around the country and the world for that matter. Dave had a question about uh, a place that he could submit ice data for his lake in northern Wisconsin. He has about 10 years of data. And Dave, I would suggest uh, we can set you up with a, a citizen lake monitoring uh, project in SWIMS for ice monitoring, and you can get all that data into that. Um, or I can help you enter it in myself if you'd be interested in that. But that does go into the state database. So uh, UW Madison and other organizations would have access to that data as well for these types of studies. Fortunately, uh, determining ice breakup and freeze is simple enough that, uh, you know, it's like a secu desk reading. It's pretty easy to do. And uh, especially if you're a year round resident. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll have one more final question here from the chat. Jim asked if there are any biological data sets to compare with these data. When we first started doing the ice work, uh, you know, when we were first funded, we had a time series for all the biological data and chemistry data we were collecting that was one year long, uh, for example, for our particular project. Uh, but in fact, now we have 40 years of biological chemical data on these lakes. And uh, there's a set of lakes in Vilas County and a set of lakes in Dane County and those data are all publicly available and uh, range from fishes to algae to temperature to phosphate and so forth. And so they are available. Uh, the only way though we were able to get 150 year data or multiple century data was to opportunistically interact with colleagues that have measured it for other reasons than this research. And so as far as the research is concerned, those records were really just serendipitous. They turned out to be very useful research records. 
And it was the only way we could begin to stretch our time series on the invisible present back uh, more than a century or more. Great. Well, thanks again, John, for presenting. I'm glad we could make this work out. Uh, thanks to all of you that joined for today's webinar or the earlier webinars this spring. If you do have suggestions for a future webinar series, please let me know and I'll see what I can arrange for that. And with that, I hope everyone has a great rest of the week and a safe Memorial Day weekend.